Hello and welcome to the Wheel of Crime podcast. This podcast is ran by two ladies who play games, mumble profanities, and laugh way too often. Also, this podcast has covered, co- covered topics of sensitive nature and as such, listener discretion is advised. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Wheel of Crime podcast. How's it going today, Em? My name, or sorry, let me say that again. My name is Jen. (laughs) My name is Emily. Oh my God. I just, sorry, listeners. I don't know how, if this is going to make it through editing or not. I just had the biggest, I don't know what it was, water, spit, something, choke, literally as soon as we hit the record button. Not good. Water squirting out of my eyes. I can't do this. Um, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, we've we've made it yet another week as we do. How are you? What have you been up to? Um, I'm surviving and not thriving, as the kids say. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I'm fine. Things are fine, right? <laughs> Just keep it afloat. My my nose and my eyes are above water. That's all I need, right? Yeah. I realized yesterday, or not yesterday, like last week, that I forgot I needed to get my passport renewed, and now it's, like, almost expired. So I'm like, ooh, I really need to do that, like, right now. Ooh, good one. See, um, when you are done doing that, you should let me know what you did, because I've been trying to avoid all of the difficult ways of doing it but i also don't understand how to renew my passport because it's not expired like this year it expires next year but they say you're supposed Mm -hmm. to get it renewed like something like seven months before you actually have to leave or before it's actually expired or something i don't know i just i'm trying to be a good noodle i just don't know how to do it yeah i i don't know i booked an appointment at a service canada place this is really boring for our listeners but <laughs> i booked a, i booked an appointment at a service canada place for like april 17th i think but i'm kind of debating i'm like should i do that or should i just mail it i don't know so that's the thing i've had so many people now tell me that like you can do it on your own and that basically going to the appointment they literally just print off the same document off the website that you can get on your own and then you fill it out and give it to them and then they mail it. You can just do it on your own, basically. But my concern is that I would do it wrong, you know? I know. That's, like, my concern. I'm like, but what if I fill something out wrong? I would rather just them tell me there instead of me mailing in my application, paying for it, and then it getting rejected or something, you know? Yeah, exactly. Or, like, I don't know, doing some other kind of fuckery with it. I'm, I'm with you on this one. I have many concerns all the time, and that is one of them. <laughs> See, I haven't renewed my passport in 10 years, so I forget everything that I was supposed to do. See, I don't understand how there's people, because it's like 10 years and then like 6 or 7 years is the other option. 5 years or 10 years. See, I could never be a 5-year person, because for that much work, yeah, I'd I'd rather just get the 10-year. I don't give a shit that I look different every 10 years, whatever. Like, I don't care. It's literally only $20 more for the extra five years. Yeah. So I'm like, it just makes economical sense to go with the 10-year one. Well, and then I had somebody tell me once, they were like, oh, but what happens if you don't plan on living in Canada for the next five years? And I'm like, I don't give a shit. Who knows where I'm going in five years? Yeah. I mean, that's future me's problem. I would rather just have the passport and worry about the rest of that shit later. Literally. Uh, yeah, no, that's super funny. So once you do get that figured out, let me know, because I also need help. Um, I'm trying to think. There was something else I was going to ask you about on the show, but I can't remember now, obviously, because that's who I am as a person. Um, (laughs) I'm trying to think about what I've been up to this week, other than my job, which is boring for everybody else. Um, I've just been doing my evening shift as a cowboy lately, you know, playing Red Dead Redemption. Yeehaw. It's been... It's been an adventure. Yeehaw. Tried hunting down a grizzly bear last night. It ate my ass and then I was sad and went to bed. Um, <laughs> Love that. <laughs> but also like hate life. that. Yeah, right. Um, and then, I don't know. See, today, 
I was hoping to have a chill day. I was just telling Jen about this before we started recording. I was hoping to have a chill day this entire week, not been chill. But I made it worse um, because I decided to make ramen for dinner, which isn't the bad part. Ramen's delicious. The problem mm -hmm. is that I got a little too adventurous and threw in some like cheese curds and some pepperoni sticks and some green onions and I made way too much food and you cannot put ramen in the fridge and save it for later so I'm like you know what I'm just gonna pound it all down and that'll be fine it was not fine I then had a stomach ache for like three hours and just now I'm getting over it oh that's terrible there's nothing quite like eating and then literally feeling it like in your throat when you're done and you're like I've, I've ruined everything I've done too much <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even enjoying it anymore. I'm just suffering. That's it. Because then you don't even feel full. You're like, no, I just feel like I might throw up if I try to talk to anybody. Like, this is hell on earth. But... Well, yeah. I don't know. I hate I hate the feeling of feeling too full. Mm -hmm. That's like one of the worst, in my opinion. Well, and like, it's so dumb because how I rationalize like food in a day, especially with working from home, is that because I'm not doing a lot of like physical activity... I should probably limit it to, like, one meal a day. But then, of course, like, if you don't eat enough, then you get snackish right before bed. So I've really been trying to, like, balance that lately. You know, just, like I said, world of suffering. Not worth it. I've been dealing with heartburn, like we talked about <laughs> on last week's episode. I can't keep living like this. Like, it's just, it's too much for me. Too much for me, my almost 30-year-old body. She cannot keep up with me. She's like, please, for the love of God, something not spicy. Yeah, she's like, no more spice, no more carbs, please sleep 10 hours, <laughs> please, thank you, go for a walk, why must you please keep me exercise. suffering, exercise, <laughs> literally, um, and then yeah, I don't know, like I said, I'm trying to think about anything else super interesting from this week, but other than that, not a whole lot, I guess, getting ready for Easter, because that's coming up. Oh, yeah, I forgot that this episode's going up on Good Friday. Sure is. For any of those. Well, my episode, to kind of segue that way, there's nothing good about it. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> so wonderful. We're going to have a great time. It didn't even happen on a Friday, so I don't even know what to tell you guys. <laughs> oh, God. All right, well. On that note, then, should we start spinning our wheel of questions? Yes. Yeah, spin away, Em. In kindergarten, when they asked you what you wanted to be when you grew up, what was your answer? Funny enough, I actually didn't have an answer. I literally remember sitting there and people being like, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, I'll be grown up. Like, <laughs> I'll probably just be doing something. Like, I and people would be like no like a job and i'm like i don't know like i don't even know what i'm gonna like when i'm an adult see my answer was a famous pop star so we had clearly out, very different vibes going on yeah i'm just panicked about the future being like don't put pressure on me i'm not in the future yet and you're like i'm gonna be famous I'm like, I'm going to be famous and rich and really successful. Um, you might want to get my autograph now. <laughs> right? Well, I guess, so not in school, but like when I was like really little, like two or three years old, when adults would ask me that question, I guess I would just tell them that I want to be a rabbit when I grew up. And now <laughs> when I think about it, it does seem significantly less stressful than what I'm doing currently. It's not a bad idea. Honestly, could be a vibe. I I feel like I might also join you on that venture. Yep. My options are either return to the forest and be a rabbit there. Um, other people, when I've told them this fun fact about me, are like, oh, like a Playboy bunny, which somehow still seems less stressful. And I mean, that could be interesting. Or third option, um, there's something other, something, oh yeah, the e an Easter bunny person who dresses up like somebody who dresses up as the easter bunny which that's at the bottom of my list i would sooner literally return to the forest and eat grass than dress up in an easter bunny costume and hang out in the mall that sounds like the worst of all of the choices and generally just the worst option like i would not want to be a mall santa or like a mall 
rabbit. That sounds awful. Anything that involves dressing up in a costume. I have genuinely thought about this throughout the years about like how people must feel or like who, what kind of person puts on, you know, these types of things and then goes to the mall. Like, you know, try to, trying to see, see how their brains work. <laughs> trying to get I in their mind. Yeah, I don't get it. Like I, especially when you look it up, like how much different types of bacteria sit in there and what they smell like and how sweaty people are. And there's different people who hang out in these things. I'm like, I think I'm good. I'm really good. See, I don't know if people on the pod know this or not, but when I was in university, I auditioned to be an elf for Santa's village in the mall. And having met, okay, also a side note, what a humiliating job interview that was, just (laughs) first of all. Second of all, the people who play Santa... Like, I can see that for them. Like, it's just a very specific type of old dude that wants to be Santa. Mm -hmm. And then also, like, the ladies who want to play Mrs. Claus. I'm like, we are not the same breed of person. Nope. And so, to kind of sidetrack a little, uh, the audition process (laughs) was... uh, it was so humiliating. There was, like, four of these small Santas and, like, two of the Mrs. Clauses in there. And yeah. they're like, okay, sing a Christmas carol right here, right now. So I'm just like, jingle bells. Jingle. <laughs> I think if I showed up to a job interview and they told me to sing them a song, I'd kill myself. <laughs> I like, really I would, thought I about it. I would implode it. on the spot. Like, oh, my God. I was not prepared for that moment at all. Like, I was not prepared. I was, like, you know, expecting to show up and just be like, oh, yeah, I like kids or whatever, you know? Like, I Christmas just need fucking great. money. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can deck the And then they were like, like okay, now business. here's a storybook. You have to read us the storybook like you're reading it to a child. And I'm like... I'm literally going to jump off a bridge after this interview. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not going to be good. You're like, I am never coming back here. Yeah. <laughs> I did get the job. I did not accept. <laughs> that fair enough. Um, but you did, wasn't for me. You did strike a memory for me, though. So when I was really little, my grandparents used to be. Uh, they used to dress up as Santa and Mrs. Claus, but they never did the mall job. What they would do is they would volunteer for, like, the children's hospital and, like, other places. Because at right. some point during my grandparents' lives, somebody must have clocked in. Because my grandparents, Jen knows what they look like, do literally look like Santa and Mrs. Claus. Can confirm, yeah. Like, jolly, white hair, the works. They literally look like <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Mm-hmm. Claus. So when they would go and they would volunteer, they would go to these places that they felt like really needed it. So like they would also go to like disability homes and like the children's hospital to do the bit because they said for them, it was all, they loved doing it. They loved being around the kids and they also know what they look like. And they're like, to keep the dream alive. And I was like, you know what? They probably appreciate that. Yeah, I can see the appeal of that. I cannot see the appeal of being a mall Santa at all. Like you said, different different sort of person. Yeah. But right. I feel like we veered very far from our question. So let's spit again. <laughs> Does your family play any sports together? Like, do you have like a... You have enough siblings to have like your own baseball team. Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah. So my dad, for like the longest time, tried to convince us to do the family baseball team thing because there's eight of us. What he failed to recognize is that literally none of us is like interested in sports mm. at all. Yeah. Now it's well, now it's a little different with my younger siblings, but like when us older siblings were like getting older and he would be like we should all go to the baseball diamond and rival one of the other teams we were like "Ooh, yeah i don't know about that one (laughs) don't know about that one good luck no thanks papa pretty much uh but my i'm like trying to go through my family members on who played sports and then actually kept playing sports because like i played but then like didn't stick it out neither did my brother 
my other brother's autistic and has zero interest in sports either. Then my sister, she, I think, I think she played volleyball for a little bit. I'm not entirely sure. But my youngest sister is has actually been on the rugby team for the last three years. So she's into that. And my youngest brother has tried really hard to be interested in sports and just isn't. And that's okay. He's like, I wish I was an athletic boy, but maybe it's not for me. Literally, his whole thing is like, he's like, I just, I try and it's just not fun. <laughs> I was like... I know. Relatable. <laughs> yeah, this is why I don't do it. So, like, um, other than my parents, which I don't know. My dad pretends to be interested in sports. I don't think he is. And my mom, who's interested in fitness, that's, like, two out of eight people who give a shit about sports. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it doesn't look good. Not a good ratio. Definitely not going to be the next. We are not making that baseball team. I don't yeah. think so. <laughs> You're not going to be the top of the league. Right. Uh, what about you? You and your family. We all played sports individually. And I think I think we were all, like, interested in sports to, like, varying degrees. Like, except for my mom. I think she genuinely has no interest in any sport at all. Um, but my dad loves hockey and football and he played a lot of sports in his youth Mm. and then my eldest sister was a soccer player my brother he kind of like dabbled in a few different sports but nothing really stuck he was like i would say kind of more like my mom where he he'll like watch some sports but he's not really a sports guy and then i played soccer for a very long time but yeah, you were always really why. into soccer. That was like your bag for a bit. Mm-hmm. But no family sports. We never like did sports together. <laughs> yeah, I can somehow see that for you and your family. Unless your mom somehow like came up with like some deep interest in soccer. I don't think it was ever going to happen. No, it was not in the cards for us. No, I've been trying to think about like... um. See, my family's more sports adjacent. Like, we have a lot of family members that play sports or play sports together. Like, Mm -hmm. because my family's humongous. Um, So as far as, like, consistencies go, most members of my family play either hockey or football. And this isn't, like, my immediate family. This is, like, my, you know, 500 cousins that are all on the same team somehow and other things. Yeah. That's fair. All right, let's spin for our next question. I like that every episode the wheel gets slightly more janky because I think every time I spin the wheel, it's loosening the bolts on the back. <laughs> so it's just like, reet, 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 reet. but um, <laughs> <laughs> number one, it's going to fall apart someday. I really will never be able to put it back together. <laughs> It's going to fly off the desk and we're going to have to edit in the sound of a wheel. <laughs> um, did you have a favorite teacher growing up? A favorite teacher? Hmm. I remember being a kid and really liking my grade three teacher. I'm trying to remember why, though. Oh, yeah, it was because she did prizes at the end of every week if you did good on your assignments. And I was pretty studious at the time. So I ended up with, like, a hundred cat figurines and other toys that came out of her closet. You're like, this is awesome. Love ya. I'm like, I get rewarded for working hard? Aw, man, this is fantastic. I really liked, I remember really liking my kindergarten teacher and then also our eighth grade English teacher and also my 10th slash 11th grade English teacher I really liked as well. Mm. Oh, I did really like um, our high school fabrications teacher because uh, he looked like Homer Simpson and he was always very kind and funny because I was, I think, one of only two girls in the fabrications yeah. class. For anybody who's not aware of what that is, that's like metalworking. And I really think he took pity on my soul. Because he was like, you seem to have an interest in this. And boys are dickheads. So (laughs) I will help you do what you need to do. And I was like, thanks. 
you the best. Um, Thanks, sir. Pretty much. I mean, he's still really nice. I think he still works at our high school. I'll have to Aww. interrogate my siblings. Um, I don't remember liking any of our middle school teachers, to be honest. I remember the grade eight in English teacher. I think I there was a bias there because she had my brother before me and like loved him. Mm. And so she just like automatically was so nice to me. I remember she didn't really like you at all. <laughs> I'm trying to remember who this person was. Was it the one with red hair? No, it's the one, the older lady with the white hair. The year we had the yeah. reading contest. Yeah, she, I don't know. I, I think she tolerated me when we were like in grade seven. She always yeah. had some kind of weird like other beef with me though. So I don't really know what her issue was. I just remember she always talked about Trinidad and Tobago. And if yep. you asked her about that, you were like in her good books. And my brother had told me that. So on like the first day I was like, oh, my, like I hurt my brother my brother who and then i like said his name and she like liked him mm-hmm. i was like said you went to trinidad and tobago that's so cool that's my number one like place i want to go in life and then she fucking loved me from that <laughs> moment on I love how you're like i learned to work the system whereas like <laughs> watch watch the reason that she didn't like me was because something happened where like on the first day i was like who the fuck cares about trinidad and tobago only losers go there and she's like i fucking hate that little girl <laughs> get her out of my classroom get her out of here oh god but yeah that's all that's all i can remember fair well let's spin for our last question then what was your least favorite subject in school math same (laughs) (laughs) very easy answer i like that that took me maybe two seconds to think about it (laughs) yeah i like i was a math hater also i just see here's my still hate math I think that I might not have hated math as much if I could actually understand what the fuck was going on. Like, it was one of those things where, like, I don't know if my brain just doesn't vibe on the same wavelength as other people who, like, really understand traditional math. But I had such a hard time with, like, trying to figure out in my brain where stuff goes together. Even today, I still don't get things. Like, I understand the concept of things, like, you know you like calculating surface area and other stuff Mm -hmm. that might be useful but like for everything else like i just it just did not connect for me it never connected for me either and i feel like it was probably partially just because i like didn't it didn't come easy to me so i like resisted it more Mm. but also probably in part just because i feel like especially when we were going to school there wasn't this understanding of like different learning types it was like Mm -hmm. you learn this way or you are gonna fail and it just I really struggled with the way that they taught math just because I need to like do something and like Mm -hmm. work through it that way to understand and I feel like that's like just not how they taught it at all yeah there wasn't too much of that for us growing up and maybe that was my other issue because I do here's my thing I work with math quite a bit unfortunately now for my work (laughs) and i understand it and i know what's going on but that's the weird part for me because i'm like it's weird for me to do this now and get it after struggling so hard in school and now i'm wondering if it's more that because i can kind of like teach myself the right way of doing things to me or for me now is being helpful versus the trying to memorize some weird oogly boogly business that somebody else came up with Yeah, I feel like it was, like, the memorization part that I struggled with. And just, like, being able to, like, practically apply the problem is way more helpful to me personally as a learner than Mm -hmm. memorization, which I was never good with. Oh, totally, yeah. But, yeah. I know, I'm trying to think about what else (laughs) in relation to that. But I really think that's just about it. And it probably also didn't help that our high school math teacher also hated my guts so honestly i had so many math teachers that were just like really mean to me and i think it's because i just didn't i hated that class i didn't really like i just resisted instead of like trying to get it i was just like checked out Mm -hmm. yeah well that was easy to do (laughs) oh i don't get it goodbye 
Very true. But do you have any guesses as to what my story is for you today? Oh, God. Um, There is a family baseball team and they all go to school together. And one of them fails math class and just goes on a crime spree, loses their goddamn minds. Well, this does take place in a math class and that's about all you got right. Ooh, all right. So today we are going to talk about Colleen Ritzer, and she was born on May 13th, 1989 in Lawrence, Massachusetts to her parents, Peggy and Thomas Ritzer. Peggy recalled Colleen's birth, which occurred on the day before Mother's Day. Her baby girl was the best Mother's Day present she ever got, she said. Colleen was the oldest of three kids, and she had a younger sister named Laura and a younger brother named Daniel. Colleen was a member of St. Augustine Church in Andover, Massachusetts. She was a 2007 graduate of Andover High School and a graduate of Assumption College in Worcester, class of 2011. In 2013, she was pursuing a graduate degree at Salem State College, and Colleen adored spending time with her family. She was an amazing daughter and big sister. She loved attending family gatherings and parties no matter the location, as long as it meant that she was spending time with her family. She always was thinking of others first. She loved going to her sister Laura's hockey games and made a lasting impression on everyone who attended. She was one of her biggest fans. So the love of her family and friends led to her organizing a family team named Footsteps for Bev in memory of her grandmother. Colleen knew she wanted to be a teacher from a very young age and worked diligently to achieve her goal. Even though it was her profession, teaching was one of her favorite hobbies and her passion. She spent countless hours finding unique and creative ways to inspire and teach her students whom she loved. In addition, she always enjoyed vacationing, cruising, shopping, and making collages. She had many friends that she loved dearly. She always had a smile on her face and loved being in pictures no matter what mood she was in. So Jennifer Berger, calling a bestie since kindergarten, said their friendship may have started in elementary school, but it grew over the years into a forever friendship. Which is what me and Emily have. It is. Love you. (laughs) The two were planning a trip together to celebrate 20 years of friendship in 2013. Which I think is a great idea. I think we should definitely plan a 20 year bestie trip. I think that'd be really cute and fun. We would need to like make it like themed too somehow. I don't know how, but it would be real fun. We got five like four or five years to figure it out so okay we'll we'll start start... planning today yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) jennifer said that colleen had simple dreams all she wanted was to love and be loved family members friends and co-workers described colleen as smiling happy young woman who fiercely loved her family and her teaching career at the age of 24 Colleen became a ninth grade math teacher at Danvers High School in Danvers, Massachusetts. Colleen was a very popular teacher with both students and colleagues. Colleen still lived at home at the time, but she was making plans to move out and also work towards her graduate degree. Colleen had a great relationship with her parents. Early every morning before she left for work, she would go to her parents' bedroom door and say goodbye which good for her because i really could not imagine living with my parents in my 20s (laughs) fair yeah her dad tom said that he told colleen she could probably work in a career where she made more money but colleen didn't care she wanted to be a teacher all of her colleagues say that she was a wonderful teacher who always made extra time for students who needed help According to one struggling student, she was always positive and happy. She made me feel like I wanted to go to math class, which that's quite a statement because I think most people hate math. I literally cannot even envision saying (laughs) that at any point. Like, I can't even pretend to be in the headspace where, like, I would say something like that. That's just so out of this world for me anyways. 
Me too. In 2013, one student who seemingly needed some extra help was named Philip Chisholm. A student overheard Colleen complimenting Philip on his drawing skills at the end of class and then requested that he stay after school so she could help him prepare for an upcoming test. After the last class period ended, they were in a second floor classroom with another student for some extra help. The other student told police that, quote, at some point, Mrs. Ritzer mentioned Tennessee. She said that Philip became visibly upset after she mentioned Tennessee. She said that Mrs. Ritzer became aware that Philip was getting upset about her talking about Tennessee. Mrs. Ritzer later changed the topic. The student witness later observed Philip apparently talking to himself after the subject was changed and Philip was seemingly remained still quite upset about Tennessee. It was a hot button issue for him. Mm. So a little backstory on Philip. He was born on January 1st, 1999. His mom, Diana, and his father, Stacy, were married in September 1998. The family lived and was raising their son in Tennessee Diana filed for divorce against Stacy in March 2001, when Philip was just two years old. Philip's dad was formerly a military man, and allegedly his father agreed during a separation from his mother to have restricted time with his son because of a, quote, prior physical and emotional abuse as well as alcohol abuse. So, things at home seem a little dicey for Philip. Mm, bit of a bit of a rocky situation. Couple reconciled in the summer of 2001, so the divorce was never finalized. And in the documents, it stated any visitation rights held by Stacy would be under the supervisation of the mother. Philip allegedly had a very chaotic childhood. His mother left his father and was repeatedly unfaithful and moved in with him friends in Tennessee, then moved the family to Florida with her father. They eventually moved back to Tennessee where Philip, his mother, and his two younger sisters shared one room. Philip would often retreat to his best friend's house and spend days with their family. In 2013, parents went through a stressful divorce and Stacy moved to Florida and Diana moved to Danvers with Philip and his younger sisters. So, in the fall of 2013, Philip was newly enrolled at Danvers High School. He wasn't that well known at the school yet, apart from being a good soccer player. He was a standout on the school's junior varsity soccer team. Some students did refer to him as antisocial and really tired and out of it. The move from Tennessee and his parents' divorce seemed to be really taking a mental toll on Philip at the time. Mm -hmm. The morning of October 22nd, 2013, the Danvers High School's newly installed security camera system showed 14-year-old Philip arriving at school with several bags, which he placed into his locker. Contained within these bags were a box cutter, mask, gloves, and a change of clothes. The school security footage also showed Colleen exiting the classroom toward the second floor woman's bathroom at around 2.54 p.m. Philip can be seen walking into the hallway, looking at her, then ducking back into the classroom and re-emerging with his hood over his head. Trailing Colleen, Philip pulled on gloves as he entered the same bathroom. Philip, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> Philip then proceeded to rob Colleen of her credit cards, iPhone, and her underwear before raping and stabbing her 16 times in the neck with a box cutter. A 14-year-old? Yeah. In a school? And she was, yeah, and she was 24, so she's 10 years older than him at this point. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. A female student actually entered the bathroom at one point, but glimpsing someone partially unclothed with a pile of garments on the floor, that student quickly left thinking they were getting changed. So he literally almost got caught in the middle. And because it's a school, nobody's thinking that you're doing anything that crazy. They're like, oh, they're changing for phys ed class. I should go. Yeah. So, Philip appeared in several different outfits throughout the crime, which police later said showed that he'd planned the murder in advance. 
At 3.07 p.m., Philip left the bathroom with a hood over his head and walked outside to the parking lot. When he came back two minutes later, he was wearing a new white t-shirt. Philip then went back into the classroom in a different red hooded sweatshirt over his head, then returned to the bathroom at 3.16 p.m., pulling a recycling bin. He reemerged in a white t-shirt and a black mask, pulling the bin with Colleen's body toward an elevator and then outside of the school. He dragged the bin all the way to a wooded area behind the school where he raped Colleen's lifeless body again, but with a tree branch this time. Just why? (laughs) So cameras then picked up Philip coming back into the school wearing a black shirt and glasses and carrying a pair of bloody jeans, completing his outfit changes for the day. When Philip didn't go home after school that day, a missing persons report was made, and hours later, Colleen's parents reported her missing. Colleen's dad said when she didn't return home from work, he left his job in nearby Beverly and went to look for her at school. He found her classroom, which he'd never been to before. The door was locked, but he peered through in through a window. He was really excited to tell Colleen later that he'd finally seen her classroom. Mm. so but obviously he he never did um after speaking with students and staff at the school police found blood in the bathroom colleen's bag and the bloody recycling bin and also colleen's bloodied clothing near the cross country path in the woods behind the school By 11.45 p.m., the CCTV footage was acquired and Philip had become a suspect. Meanwhile, Philip used Colleen's credit card to buy a movie ticket and then he left the theater to steal a knife from another store. He was walking along a darkened highway outside of Danvers when he was stopped by police on a routine safety call at 12.30 a.m. A frisk search of Philip for identification turned up Colleen's credit card and driver's license. Philip was taken to the local station where his backpack was searched and Colleen's purse and underwear were found alongside the box cutter covered in dried blood. According to court documents, when Philip was asked whose blood was whose blood it was he said it's the girls he initially said that he found them and then he said that he had taken it from her car but yeah we know that's not true when asked if he knew where she was he chillingly replied she's buried in the woods at 3 a.m police discovered the gruesome sight of colleen's half-naked body covered with leaves near a pair of stained white gloves she was naked from the waist down and her body had been sexually staged the court papers said an indictment said that philip sexually assaulted her with an object which we know is the tree branch Mm -hmm. um and a branch had to be pulled from her vagina Mm. there was a folded handwritten note laying nearby worded i hate you all but there is like i've just been like trying to process what you're telling me instead of just commenting on everything i genuinely do not understand how somebody who's 14 can come up with this kind of stuff like that's on another level and then to also be doing things that show how immature they are like the throwing leaves on her the lying about stuff when they literally have footage of it happening like it's just it's very it's it just i don't understand it obviously I don't know if anybody can, but I also just don't get the motivation, I guess. Like, it just, the, the whole thing seems so strange to me. It seems strange to me, too, because you could say, like, oh, maybe he was just really upset with her over the whole bringing up Tennessee thing. But he had but literally even... already planned to do it. Like, he had already brought all the shit to school. But that's the thing. And then it's, like, also, again... Like, I was 24 once. If a 14-year-old, because I know what they, I know who they are and what they look like and how they act. If a 14-year-old came at me with a box cutter, I wouldn't just, you know? I, that's also weird to me. Like, I'm not saying e- either, like, I don't know what that would be like in that situation. But that just seems weird to me, again, on how things happen the way that they did, you know? Yeah, I think my if i was going to speculate 
he probably caught her by surprise. Like she walked into the bathroom mm. and he came up behind her and started fucking stabbing her. I feel like yeah. You know? The, the, yeah, that's fair. See, yeah, I'm just thinking I think it's weird for me because I have younger siblings, so I'm, I'm kind of constantly around kids of varying ages or at least have been throughout life and i think that might be the weird part for me because i know like i said i know how 14 year olds are and how i picture a 14 year old in my brain versus the 14 year old you're telling me about i'm like this does not add up i'm gonna take a wild guess and say that most 14 year old would not do this or at least i hope they would not or even think about it because that's that's my yeah. other thing that i'm not understanding is the thought process like most 14 year olds you meet if they're having dark thoughts, it's usually, it's like a self-isolated thing. Like, nobody's usually lashing out in this kind of way. They're more worried about going to their friend's house, playing Roblox. If it was today, maybe making TikToks. Like, those are the three things I could think <laughs> of on what a 14-year-old is thinking about, you know? Yeah. So, the night of her murder, her parents, Tom and Peggy... We're actually sitting in the Danvers police station where he and Peggy had just reported her missing. Her dad heard a helicopter buzzing overhead. He overheard an officer say something about crime scene services and he prayed that Colleen was all right. Our world ended that night, Tom said, recalling two officers telling him that Colleen's body had been found. So, like, just imagine you're sitting in a police station, like, ready to report your daughter missing because you're like, Mm -hmm. she hasn't turned up. And you're literally hearing the events unfold of them finding her murdered. See, I feel like if I was in that situation, I would have such a pit in my stomach already. Because I'd be like, oh god, like, what if this is... And then the more you hear, the more you're like, oh my god, it's her, isn't it? You know? Yeah. I can't even imagine how awful that would be. And 24 is so young. Like, it's it's weird to think, though, because, like, I feel like when we grew up, 24 was, like... Obviously, you're a kid. You think that people in their 20s are old anyways. But even feel like yeah. in the media, like 20-year-olds <laughs> were already like married and had kids or something at that point. But when you think about it, 24 is still so young. It really is. And uh, yeah. So Philip was charged as an adult with murder and with aggravated rape and robbery as a juvenile offender. He pled not guilty, and his mother said that her, quote, heart is broken for Colleen. During the trial, his lawyer admitted Philip killed Colleen, but he said he was suffering from severe mental illness and was not criminally responsible for his actions. A psychiatrist who testified for the defense said that Philip was hearing voices and in the midst of a psychotic episode when he killed Colleen. Philip's maternal grandmother and aunt had a history of psychotic disorders, and the defense pointed to those genes as indication that Philip also suffered from psychosis. Dr. Richard Dudley, the defense expert psychiatrist, said he saw a lot of trauma-related symptoms in Philip. Philip refused to talk about some issues and seemed dissociative from his own childhood experiences however dr dudley could never pinpoint what the trauma was Hmm. so i don't know if that really explains it or gives any motivation but basically they're chalking it up to he's got like some form of psychosis and was having like a mental breakdown I guess. See, I don't know enough about, like, those, that specific type of mental illness. Because then, to me, I'd be like, well, how deep is the psychosis if he had enough clarity of mind to bring four different outfits (laughs) to school, you know? Like, I I I don't know much about that kind of thing, but that that's the kind of thing I would wonder about. Or, like, um, they're like, oh, or, like, he's got trauma. And it's like, I do not know what kind of trauma makes a 14-year-old go after a 24-year-old woman with everything he's got. But that that would be great. Like, that's crazy. It is. So, Philip was actually convicted of raping Colleen inside the bathroom, but was acquitted of the second rape committed with a tree branch in the woods near the school where Philip put her body. He was also convicted of armed robbery for stealing Colleen's credit cards and her underwear. On February 26, 2016, at the age of 17, Philip was sentenced to serve at least 40 years in prison. 
On the first degree murder conviction, Salem Superior Court Judge David Lowry sentenced Philip to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 25 years. He received a 40 year concurrent sentences on rape and robbery charges. The trio of sentences handed down mean that Philip must serve at least 40 years in prison and that he received 857 days credit for his time he's already served. The Ritzer family called the sentences unacceptable and said that laws must be changed. They said, quote, we are devastated and feel betrayed by Judge Lowry's inability to give three consecutive life sentences without the eligibility for parole to the individual that took Colleen's life in such a horrific manner. The family said in a statement issued after the verdict was handed down, we are disgusted and personally offended with the defense's repulsive recommendation that Colleen's killer be parole eligible within 15 years, therefore putting him back into society at the age of 29 to kill again. The defense's legal maneuvering is despicable and demonstrates utmost disrespect for our daughter and sister Colleen's life. Evil cannot be rehabilitated, the family said. See... I kind of agree with them in a way for this particular situation because it's always so hard, I think, to pass judgment on, like, specifically child crimes or child murder. But then you kind of got to look at the factors, though. It's like, okay, like, say it's kids and they accidentally kill another kid and whatever, that gets tried differently. Or if it's a kid who somehow does something that then causes an adult to die and they're not fully aware of like what death is yet or any of that kind of stuff. Like, I feel like that's kind of, that would be more applicable to this Mm -hmm. judge's particular sentencing. But I think that by the age of 14, if you have the wherewithal to rape an adult woman twice, to kill her, to rob her and do pretty much everything that he did that's like that's another level that's not that's not this is a kid who doesn't know what he's doing anymore you know what i mean this is a kid who not only knows what he's doing he wanted to do what he did and he brought four outfits so that he thought he could outsmart the cctv footage yeah like his whole plan was to do what he wanted and get away with it like he's not doing any of this by accident this isn't a cause and effect situation this is somebody who scarily has the idea of planning out a murder and then going through with it at the age of 14 that is a scary thing that is not something where like you have them go to jail at 14 get raised basically in the prison system for 15 years where they can then you know learn whatever it is that they learn maybe they learn to be manipulate people or however in that situation just to then come out in 15 years and do crazy shit in the streets like i do not agree with that yeah unfortunately there's more oh why do you got to do this to me (laughs) so the family said that due to the sentence they will be forced to attend parole hearings in 38 years and which is simply unimaginable to us Tom and Peggy said as they age, Dan and Laura will have to assume the responsibility. However, we want to be very clear at every parole hearing, our family's voice, Colleen's voice will be heard. We pledge as Colleen's loved ones to apply the same vigor for life that Colleen demonstrated every day to righting this moral wrong. The family said Colleen's sister, Laura, in her impact statement to the court said that the family will never give up on justice for Colleen. You picked the wrong family to mess with and we will never give up, she said. So, one day, one single day after Philip was sentenced for Colleen's murder, Philip found himself back in court for a different attempted murder. What do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah, he was arraigned on charges including attempted murder by strangulation, assault with intent to murder, kidnapping, and two counts of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, the dangerous weapon being a pencil and a cinder block wall. On June 2nd, 2014, so 15-year-old Philip was being held at the Metro Youth Services Facility in Boston while awaiting trial for Colleen's murder. 
The attempted murder and assault charges stemmed from an alleged incident in the Dorchester Youth Detention Facility. Prosecutors say that Philip allegedly spent the day uh, of the attack watching a 29-year-old female clinician eventually sneaking by a distracted staffer and into a private staff-only bathroom where he pounced. The victim tried to scream, but it was ineffective because her airway was closed by the virtue of the defendant strangling her, prosecutor Mark Zanini said, repeatedly punching her in the head, right side of the face. The motive for the attack on that woman was never made clear. However, thankfully, the 29-year-old female clinician did survive. I now have a suspicion. I now have a suspicion. So, first of all, I did not think that was going to get crazier. Just to put that out there. But, and I understand we're talking about a 14-year-old. I got a preface with that. I kind of am starting to think that this is either, like, uh, I think it was, what, Ted Bundy? Who profiled the women he attacked off of, like, his mother or something like Mm -hmm. that? If I'm remembering correctly. It's either one of those things, and he's got a particular issue with older women who look a certain way, or a fetish thing, because it's weird that he would do the same M.O. twice to a woman who is older than him in the, like, 10 to 15 year mark. That is very bizarre to me. It's strange for sure that he, like, basically was trying to repeat the crime. Uh Uh-huh, especially because in the first crime... Rape was tied so significantly to the murder as well, and then he attempted it a second time. That's what's saying to me that I half wonder if this is also, like, partially a fetish thing where he is getting off on the idea of getting a woman who's so much older than him, like a, like a power dynamic thing alone, taking advantage of them, doing what he wants with their body, and then, like, robbing them, killing them, like, getting the one up on them. Like, it, 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 like, it's got that stank on it, you know what I mean? I don't know what kind of stank, but it's got stank on it. It for sure is stanky. Mm -hmm. So, following the arraignment, the Ritzer family released a statement that said, Our thoughts are with the victim of his most recent attack, her family and her loved ones. We find it unconscionable that a juvenile charged with such a heinous crime is afforded the freedom to roam the facility in which he was incarcerated, a luxury that enabled him to attack another young woman. This attack was preceded by clear warnings from prosecutors that he's a very dangerous individual. Any any individual who repeatedly commits such violent acts should be confined in a way that those around the him are not put at risk. Victims and their families should, at the very least, be comforted by some degree of security knowing that such individuals are securely locked in a cell and closely monitored. So, Philip is currently serving his sentence at a correctional center in Shirley. Defense lawyers for Philip are currently working on an appeal for his murder conviction, insisting that jurors should have been allowed to consider the effects of the adolescent brain development when deciding on the teenager's fate in the original murder trial. A brief was filed in January 2023 to the judicial court. Philip is now 24, the same age that Colleen was when he murdered her. And Colleen's funeral services were held at St. Augustine Church, the church where Colleen's family worshipped. The church was filled with mourners. You can see the effect that she had on how the community has bonded together to commemorate and celebrate Colleen's life, her cousin Gina McDaniel said in her eulogy. About 400 Danvers High School students were among the estimated 1,000 people who gathered to pay final respects to Colleen. Colleen's positivity and kindness was contagious and well-known by everyone in her life. A good friend of Colleen's started a campaign called Kindness for Colleen, which encourages everyone to perform random acts of kindness in Colleen's honor on October 22nd. These efforts include everything from everything and anything from holding the door for someone to buying someone's coffee thanking all those who support you, teaching lessons of kindness in the classroom, or simply sharing a smile. And the campaign has actually been going strong for the last 10 years, and they're still keeping up with it. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. 
So, moral of the story, Colleen was a very nice lady, and Philip does not seem to be a very nice man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you break it down. Um, I just gotta say, one thing that you said towards the end kind of stood out to me. It is so weird to me. I know I've said that probably a hundred times this episode. It is so weird to me that his defense lawyers are like, puberty fixed is murderism? <laughs> what? <laughs> That is, yeah, they're like that is crazy. They're like, like he was just young. They're like we all feel murderous at fourteen. You can't blame him. He's an adult now. It's different, and it's like, no, that's not a thing. No, no. I definitely didn't want to murder people at fourteen. <laughs> pre puberty, during puberty, post puberty. I never once thought of going and taking a box cutter to people. Believe it or not, thought never crossed my mind even once. Me either. So. And that's the, just the two of us. I can only imagine what other people think. Yeah, the statistics just are not statistic statisticking. Statistic-ing. Yeah, the statistics are certainly also statistically not in his favor, in my opinion. For um, sure. And maybe if we were better at math. Yeah. I don't know. Who's to say? Yeah. But from where I stand, the math is in our court. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is just the whole thing is so unfortunate, though. Like, I really feel for the victims and the victims families because you th- you really do think as an adult that you can go into most places, especially with children and feel safe and just especially to be in the situation. Yeah. And then but that's the thing. As a teacher, you're worried when you go into a school of people coming into the school and hurting the kids. You're not worried about the kids hurting you in the school. Yeah. I don't know. And it's just, it's all crazy. Cause like, I mean, I know like gun violence is a huge topic of worry and discussion in the U S and it's just, yeah, it's like it's poor teachers it's like- just like, I have to worry about so much shit nowadays, like about students trying to kill them or each other. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like teachers do not get paid enough to deal with this. Mm-mm. truthfully like like imagine working a job every day where you have to walk in you got to be like okay whose death do i have to worry about today like that is just nobody should have to deal with that unless you signed no. up for it and you work in some industry where that's a thing that's going on not a school definitely not a school i feel like the teachers do not make nearly enough to worry about getting gunned down or stabbed with a box cutter like oof. among the various other things that happened in this case which like i said it's just it's so awful all the way around it's awful it's weird it's bizarre i can't wrap my head around it i'm kind of mad <laughs> i'm grossed out there's a lot of things happening in my brain right now all of the above but uh that's the end of our very not good tale for the- a very the not good, good Friday, good Friday if you celebrate. episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. If you like today's episode, you can always leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening to our podcast. You can feel free and go ahead. Uh, besides that, we also have our website, which is www.wheelofcrime.com if you want to check us out on there. If you would like to write us an email about anything, whether it's there's some kind of fuckery going on with the show or you just got a fun thing to tell us, you can email us, wheelofcrime at gmail.com. We also have our social media, which is on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Wheel of Crime. And we have our Patreon, which is Wheel of Crime, at Patreon, if you would like to donate to the show. And lastly, we are keeping up our uh, listener story uh, document, docuform? I don't know what Google Doc? It. Google Doc. Um, on our social media, if you listen to one of our stories and you have uh, something related that you want to share, or it reminds you of a... A crime or something spooky that happened to you. We do. We are a very broad podcast. So if there is something that relates to uh, something you've listened to on the show, feel free to write in and let us know. Yeah, and that's it. That's all. We'll see you guys all next week for another new episode. Okay, bye. Bye.